Okay, we'll get started. Um, as always, please feel free to grab a seat um, once you have your food. And uh, after the talk, we'll, we'll have a lot of opportunities for questions and conversation. Um, I'm very excited that uh, Jeff Eggert Peluso is here with us tonight. Uh, Jeff is the Vice President of Global Store Development and Brand Experience at Levi Strauss and Company. Um, he also notably spent 18 years at Ralph Lauren. Um, and some of those were spent in Hong Kong leading the design and development of stores in Asia. Um, Jeff and I met earlier in the week and we talked about the, the workshop he'll lead this weekend, which I'll, I'll get into in a second, and we also talked about this lecture. Um, so I've seen it already, it's great, uh, you're gonna love it. Um, what I would pay attention to in particular is the way in which architecture demonstrates its value as it pertains to, to brand identity and brand experience. And, I really like the way in which, I'm giving, I'm giving it away. I really like the way in which Jeff is gonna talk about how the two different companies that he've, he's worked for have dra dramatically different approaches to brand experience through the architecture of the spaces uh, in which products are sold. Um, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jeff's also here to lead a workshop. Um, it's part of the Ahern workshop series. There will be one more after this one. Um, and those of you that are in the workshop know it, will begin tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, and as we've been doing with other workshops, the students will design products and a pop-up store that really engages with, again, brand experience, brand identity, both of Levi's and of the school. Um, and I think the results have been really, really great. We'll find a way to share them with everybody um, as we conclude. Um, also of note, Jeff is from Central New York, and even more important, he's a graduate of this program, um, which is really exciting. He's, he's been in the places that you've been, although the building was a little bit different when he was here. Um, so please help me welcome Jeff back to Syracuse Architecture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, uh, the... the uh, Syracuse University School of Architecture team for finding me <laughs> and for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, it's really great. It's out of my comfort zone to come here and do this. Um, I have done some talks, you know, for like future stores where we all, all the brands kind of come talk about the experiences, but I haven't done a lecture before, so this is very new, um, but I'm excited. And I um, just want to start off, yes, I work at uh, Levi Strauss and Company. I'm in charge of global store development for brand experience. Um, I have a team of four people, there's four pillars, store design, which is Jesse Moyer. Uh, I have um, a person, uh, Eden Love, who does OFI, which are owner furnished items, which are fixtures, mannequins, all that kind of stuff, from a design all the way through to procurement um, and getting those, uh, those items to the store for construction. I have a, and I have a recently created role, which I created, which is a uh, global construction person who is strategic in coming up with the policies and procedures for construction when it comes to sustainability, uh, for cost, for efficiencies, uh, for data. Uh, it's becoming more and more important that we focus on that as a company. Our global footprint is huge. We're in Kuwait. We're in every country in the world, I would say, uh, which is different than Ralph Lauren. Um, there was not that broad of a, a scope. But um, that's what's been so great about going to Levi's. I also have another person in charge of decor, uh, decorative. Uh, when we opened up Times Square, my boss was kind of covering the decor duty. And it wasn't as well done as it could have been if we didn't have somebody focus on it, somebody who's talented, who understands how to get the emotion to the consumer through the layers of decor that go into a store, the interior decoration. Um, we. We're looking into that, making sure the experience also includes the emotion. So that's just a intro, intro the intro. Um, the introduction I just want to start off with is just the basics of retail design that I remind myself and my team reminds me and we remind each other often. Uh, retail is a business of selling goods and services. Uh, I, I hear this sometimes, uh, we're not selling fixtures, we're not selling mannequins, we're not selling the store, we're selling a product that's in the store that is the business we are in. Uh, product is paramount, and it's to be in harmony with the environment. So you don't want the environment to over, overshadow the product. Uh, we recently designed, which you're gonna see, a way that we took all the 
the fixture out of the wall so the product comes forward. That's kind of the principle we're thinking of. Retail design's focus is how to best serve the consumer. It's always focused on the consumer. That's, that's our client. That's who it wins. We do a lot of data, and you'll see a little bit of that in this presentation. All retail points of sale provide excellent opportunities to connect the consumer to the brand through experience. Uh, we're focusing on connecting us to Levi's. What does Levi's mean? What's the ethos of the brand? And how do we do that through graphics or through uh, how they experience the brand in the store, how they connect to the product is very important in, the, in real life. <laughs> um, a great experience will sell goods and services on repeat. Uh, if you get a consumer happy with that experience, they're going to come back, and that's really very important. The highest attribute in a great retail experience that delivers sales is human-to-human -human engagement in the store. Uh, even after all this work we've done, and we've done a lot of work, and we've done a lot of testing, the human-to-human -human interaction is what wins consumers, that kind of connection to a person who can help you with that product and make you feel good in that product. Um, so the store design's role is to be, provide the best environment for both consumer journey of self-discovery, so you have to kind of like, how do you communicate without a person? who happens to you know, get into your stores, and then an interaction with the brand sales representatives, which Levi's likes to call stylist. In Disney, it's called a cast member. It's very important we focus on the, that team because they're the ones on the ground interacting. Store development balances store design with cost, timing, and quality to build and grow the business. That's that triangle, cost, timing, quality. You can't have both. <laughs> you, you can only have two, you can't have all three. So anyway. So Ralph Lauren, um, this is a quote I found. Uh, I was very influenced by movies. I was very influenced by the world that had a sense to dream, or sense of dream. And this is him in his ranch. Uh, he, you know, living the life of being on a ranch, and that's his movie. You know, that's what he is uh, into. There's lots of other movies that Ralph puts together and brings to the consumer. Uh, it's a lifestyle, aspiration of lifestyle. So you can buy the goods, you can put them on, you can build the house, you can decorate your house, and you can feel connected as this total movie that's about to come. So, so Ralph Lauren Home Collection, I just wanted to share this with you. This is my observation. Um, when I was working at Ralph Lauren, I was doing department store corners, really fast <laughs> designs for, for uh, Asia, the Asia market, and then grew into Europe and then it was uh, US, and as it grew into that, they're very short, quick projects. Um, I didn't know where the ethos came, like the design details, but what I did discover after time is these showrooms are where that's kind of the laboratory for Ralph Lauren. Uh, home collection is a big part of their business, uh, so that has to reflect in their stores. You have to have the ideals of that kind of brand throughout the entire um, fleet. So this is, these are actually like stage sets or movie sets. They actually hire people who are set designers for soap operas in New York who put these together. They even go so far as having like an outdoor scene with, you know, this landscape, this like Duratran image in the background. And they do these twice a year. They cost a lot of money, but they are great proving grounds for what we want to do for our decor and how we want to show up. This is called the Grace Kelly Room. That's a Cary Grant Room, another reference to films. He is very much into that idea. So it translates to stores. This is our store, or sorry, our, not mine anymore, Ralph Lauren store in Saint Germain. It opened while I was in Hong Kong. Uh, and while I was in Hong Kong, we were about to go and built a lot of stores. As you can see, this facade is very uh, traditional. Um, that seems to be what Ralph Lauren wanted to to do is go into luxury stores with these traditional storefronts, either building him himself or you know, being part of the, the context of the fabric of the city. But really, that, that's how their luxury stores are going to be. Uh, if you see Manhattan, uh, Chicago, um, all around the world, they were building these like mansions. And they call them the mansions. And so as you can see the interior, it says Rococo, Parisian style, mixed in with uh, modern uh, touches of uh, decor. So, um, and this store actually has a uh, restaurant called Ralph's in a, in a courtyard. So, not clicking. Did it go? No, it went backwards. It won't go forwards. <laughs> so, 
So, uh, stuck. Okay. <laughs> so this route, yeah, okay. When I was there, the reason I bring this up is when I was at, um, in Hong Kong setting up offices, hiring people uh, to build up this uh, business because um, it used to be done uh, by a license called Dusan, I'm sorry, Dixon. And Dixon owned the license for Ralph Lauren. And when we bought it back, we had to hire our own people and our own teams. We couldn't adopt the teams like we did for Japan recently before that. And that's why I was sent over there to set up the offices. But I also wanted that because I wanted to expand my scope to include these luxury retail stores. So I became, me and my team became more the execution of building those stores. So I learned a lot about construction uh, in that market and learned from the team that I hired because they had a lot of experience in that. So I'm bringing up the facade of um, Prince's Building, which is in Hong Kong. It's, uh, it's, it's to show the facade that we came up with. Um, it was really difficult for the whole team to imagine how to do a facade when you're seeing from like Gucci and all the other brands and Prada. It's just very much a surface that is like with a lot of light and a lot of uh, attention. And so what he did is he picked his favorite um, artwork and it's just like, it's just in his office. It became this billboard and illuminated artwork. So um, even the Ralph Lauren signage was a debate because they like to keep it small and very, like almost like a, like a, a card, you know, you'd have in your, you know, your business card, but very small. And we're like, no, you gotta go big in this market. Everybody is going bigger. You gotta get attention. You gotta really stand out. So that became um, the facade and it translated to this building in Shanghai, uh, L Avenue. It's a LVMH uh, mall, and um, it works well in this kind of environment. You can't just transport the Saint-Germain store <laughs> facade to this. It would look very terrible. So a lot of things that they had to extend themselves in understanding and open themselves up to being different and creating something new for the brand. So some of the interiors. And then this is uh, Bleecker Street, which was the, sorry, I'm going too fast. Bleecker Street, which was the kind of the, the, the origin of what became our shop and shops and department stores all over the world when it came to, because when we were in uh, department stores in Korea or in Japan, they're about 3,000 square feet. They're like little stores. We do about, did about 80 a season, so about 160 a year, and just kept pumping them out more and more. So we had to be really very quick and systematic about getting those done and still give them feeling and the, the the ethos of Ralph Lauren, and it's the children's wear store. So, and WRL, again, going back to his, uh, his home and his ranch, it's this idea of the romantic vision of the Western, of the cowboy, and how he can bring it with that product with WRL, very Americana. It's an emporium feeling, it's a set. I mean, they hire someone to do faux finishing, so it makes it look like it's been water damaged. It's like, that's how much of a set it is. So I'm going on to Levi's. So this is Levi Strauss. Uh, he started the company in, and it was like, was it 1873, I think? No, around that time, yeah. Sorry, I forget. But um, anyway, he, this is a quote for him. Objects are what matter, only they carry the evidence that throughout the centuries something really happened among human beings. And the reason I put this up here is that I was talking to a, a woman I work with. Uh, she's, in, uh, she's my project manager, product manager for IT. And she was telling me a story because I was talking about this lecture. And she said that my grandmother is in Nebraska. And when I told her I was working for Levi's, she's like, oh yeah, the, the jeans, the, the cowboys, the workers. She had this high, high regard for Levi's. And she was like, and then I heard you know, Janis Joplin and this album and she talks about Levi's and how I'm gonna go home and put on my Levi's. And she said, there's these two women that are diametrically different in their perceptions of the world, but they all had the same feeling about the same item, which was Levi's, that object, which I thought was pretty interesting. and really plays in the idea of authenticity, authentic self-expression. That's one of our key ethos for Levi's is we're not gonna tell you how to do your house or how to wear it or how to put it together. We're gonna let you, what, let you look at this Levi's or you put it on and make it your own. And how are you gonna make it your own? 
So these are very different approaches that I learned going from one to the other that I had no idea until I got there how different they were. So this is the pioneer concept we had for uh, Levi's. It's a pretty generic storefront. Um, the, the, the concept was based on Donald Judd and American uh, art and how it could uh, just be very simplistic and uh, use really simple natural materials. Uh, this looks really good and I thought it looked great, but over time I learned that um, it was dark, it was very brooding kind of feeling. Um, that fixture, they call it the Malibu shelving, is not great for merchandising. It's not flexible. You don't have the ability to you know, do different things. As time goes by, our ideas about how we want to merchandise our products or display them change. This is not able to change. It's very, very too, too narrow. So um, we develop more of this concept. We lighten the walls. We put in a tailor shop. We put in larger fitting rooms. The storefront, again, still looks generic. And th what I realized is that the logo became the thing. We could put a logo on anything, and it'll, it'll, people will go to the store, and they, they find us. But that was putting too much heat on the, on the logo. And I really wanted, as an architect, wanted to look at something. What could we design to have an iconic storefront that you see around the world? Burberry has one, and you definitely know, without the signage from a distance, that's Prada, or that's Gucci, or that's Burberry. So that was like my challenge. This is the story. <laughs> These are the fitting rooms for Pioneer. A lot of pine, a um, lot of warehouse kind of feel. And so we did a lot of research as a company on the next future store of what we're going to do. Um, this was all done by going around the world to Paris, to Shanghai, to New York, to uh, Chicago, looking at our consumers and how they interacted in our store. Uh, we physically went there and counted people. We talked to them. We had our consumer insights go and do shop alongs to find out what was on their mind. And so we found that 50% of our consumers going in our store had intended to purchase, and some didn't. We saw a, a lot of good evidence that they did not purchase, and we asked why. They said, oh, it's a sea of, of denim. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to like start deselecting what I need. Um, also, 40% uh, consumers are interested in personalized clothing which we do, I mean, Levi's is all about um, either repairing, patching, or um, putting uh, embellishments or patches, uh, embroidery. That's been a part of our ethos as a brand for, for many, many decades uh, through generations. So the most compelling uh, point is that 70 uh, 60 to 70 percent of sales go through the fitting room, which means that we calculated that 70 percent the consumer is more apt to purchase 70% of the time if they try our jeans on the fitting rooms. So we have to give them a good fitting room experience. So that Pioneer before, they were small like a, a telephone booth. They had drapery, and that made people nervous because you can just walk in with a drapery. So we just, that's not gonna work for us. We gotta give more space to this. And that's a fight to have with commercial teams that we're gonna take a floor area and double it for fitting rooms and not put product on the floor but we convince them, and it continues today uh, for Levi's. But the moments of truth is fit and style. That's what we can own. Customization, we can also own. And a seamless experience, this came up with Omnichannel. That became a real big part of how do you connect the consumer to the e-com uh, for like an endless aisle of the ability to purchase. And this is some calculations that we got with our teams. Uh, they are in-house consumer insights team. They spend their time and they hire agencies to go out and do shop alongs and get qualitative data, uh, quantitative data to evaluate and to see how what we need to do, what, how we <laughs> need to proceed, or is it working, yes or no. Again, it was through that analysis that we did discover with many comparison to stores, A-B testing, that um, the service is the most important thing that we've been driving for. It's not just the store and the way it looks, it is how you interact with the teams in the store. Okay, so we came with four pillars and we hired a firm, an architecture firm called FRCH, and they've now changed their names to Nelson. They're based out of Ohio. They, are, um, they, helped, they were picked out of an RFP. We had four or five different contestants, um, but they were picked because they had a lot of experience in connecting with technology to the consumer. They did American Girl, so you could do your uh, reservations, and so we wanted to tap into that. But they were great in getting the entire company together, 
to talk about what we thought our future store would be. So we talked to merchandisers, we talked to the design team, the product team, everybody had a voice in this. And we brought it all down to these principles. So they needed a guide, and this, was, this came from us, is um, from our CMO, actually, and our brand president. They came up with these four pillars. Uh, amplify the brand is one of the pillars. We want you know to do this. So the brand promise is authentic self-expression, like I was talking about before. Uh, the personality is um, authentic, optimistic, purposeful, courageous, effortless, and connected. Increased retail experience is another pillar. So that store you saw when I first came in had no experience, really. It was just a store. Uh, we really dug deep in like what are the experience, the consumer path, the purchase, the consumer journey through the store from the front all the way to the back. So the three second wow was an idea because we saw that people would just walk in and just keep on going and they wouldn't even be able, you know, wouldn't even engage. We also understood that people would just walk by. We wanted to catch people's eyes as they walked by to like look into the store. Fit and style capabilities, again, there's 34 fits for men's, there's 27 fits for women's. If you go to any other store like Madewell, others, they, don't only, they may only offer five or six fits, but we offer extensive amount of fits for people for many, uh, you know, very diverse uh, fits for, for people, for consumers. And that's why the endless aisle is very important because then you can connect the consumer to the e-com. So we can't, these stores are too small to have everything in there. So we have to be able to connect them to their product in another way. And customization and personalization. So advanced sustainability, always on our forefront, always in, you know, that's our values, that's our brand values. We are continually pushing for that in our products, our worker well-being, as well as the store. Uh, evolve the economic model. It has to work. It has to sell. It has to not overcost and become impossible of us to make money. It has to be balanced in that. You just, there's not a, like a checkbook for this where you can just do whatever you want just for the sake of the consumer and experience. We have to balance that with the right decisions and really focusing on what's going to work, what's important. Okay. So this is our consumer journey touch points. Start in the front, and you have the entry exhibition, we called it. Uh, fit camps, which was a way to deselect or understand, like, am I a slim or am I a straight? How do you find that quickly? And then be able to go, okay, that sea of denim is easier to navigate. Um, shop sets, uh, we wanted to do, instead of a table with a nester, very simply, and it's a lot of cubic volume of space that's just wasted. We wanted to make a modular, kind of a square footprint uh, fixtures that have different heights, so it has an essence of a curation. So if you put the product on there, it feels more curated. Tailor Shop is a hub of the store, style lounge, larger space, and the fit rooms. Just dedicating more to that, there's a hierarchy to that, um, having that size. It was important that we got our commercial teams to understand that we are going to take over this much of the store for this fit experience. That's what we can do for our consumer. And it's supposed to inspire conversion, where you know there's traffic coming in the store. We're measuring people coming in. We're measuring against, against what's sold. So this came out of our discussions. This is the uh, storefront. And it's both, supposed to be about like weaving. And at the time, the CMO was really into like the dark background with a gold or something. So it was very <laughs> of the moment. And we didn't really like it. Um, a lot of the other stuff we really loved, and it works. But this, the team and I didn't. So then we uh, built this proof of concept store, which we didn't actually do any, well, we did some shop drawings, but they basically, the, the, the builders of these stores had to use it from the rendering. And it was like a condition that we had to go fast. So we couldn't do prototypes, which drove us all crazy. We're very nervous. We're very <laughs> nervous about that because that's not our process. You want to build those fixtures, you want to put product on it, you want to stand around it before you put it into a store. But the drive was just, just do it. And so it was exciting, actually. It was kind of fun. So um, we came up with this idea of a lenticular facade, optical illusion. It's on an angle. And um, you have one side is wood, the other side is blue. And we thought the blue should be an ombre slat. We call it this ombre slat facade. And it's to the idea is that you know, there's a 501. The life of a 501 goes from a dark, rigid gene and through time you know, turns into this beautiful personalized pair of jeans that has history and has markings of, 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 of a life of that. And so that became the, uh, the idea. And so there's a section. Uh, and so this is what we did for uh, Stanford. This is our first proof of concept store. 
and it was very successful. When you do walk by it, it's pretty amazing. You, 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 it just moves. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool. So then we, it just grew. We were in uh, Century City and also in the Domain, which is in Houston, Texas. Uh, and then we did some recently in India, and it keeps growing. And then this was a recent project in Bogota. And this was a very, they just overtook an old store. I think it was like some kind of cool architecture, actually, very, very dynamic. And if we didn't have this concept, that would have just looked very generic, like a generic building. But now that we have this, it becomes a really great skin for us to cover, and it's pretty you know, recognizable now. And it's working with our landlords. They want us in the store. They want us to, they want us to come in with this concept. So just really quick, that's the shop set, you know, the whole idea of, of sorry. There's the fit camp, the taper. We're talking to the consumer. And then we have the, the shop sets. The idea was also opening up the storefront and being completely open like Apple. You know, Apple's very open. All the stores are starting to go that place. Consumers don't want to, like, not see in the store or see out. And we did a lot of testing on that because there's a lot of doubt. I mean, you have these commercial people who are like, no, I want a set. I want a set design like Ralph Lauren. But it's like, no, the consumers don't really want that. And so we had to think of ways to communicate. And then also I agree that if you put mannequins in a window and you see that mannequin, you don't recall what that mannequin was wearing. You're spending a lot of time dressing that. And when you go into the store, you're like, oh, I want that, I don't know. And then you just see what's in front of you. So we brought the mannequins in the store. We brought the windows in the store. So this is the prototype of the store. Of, in, sorry, the uh, proof of concept in Stanford. And um, you start to see the, uh, we call them the feature portfolios. So this was about voting when it opened. And that was where you can buy the product. So it's almost a shoppable window inside the store. And this kind of translates to other projects really well about getting that kind of Three second wow as you walk by, you know, it's either an LED screen or it's a light box, but it's really helping us, you know, articulate the brand to the consumer, bringing it closer to the, the storefront. And that's a feature portfolio. Another example, another example in Bogota. And then we have the tailor shop, hub of the store. It's been interesting. Uh, it's been great um, trying to get that into stores. It actually becomes a good beacon point for people to understand in the hub of the store, where do I go? Where do I go to like help? Where do I stand if I, everybody's busy? I know where to go, I go here. So it becomes almost a concierge desk within the store. I know a lot of brands are going for like handhelds and no cash wraps, but I think for our category, it really becomes important for returns and for everything else. We, we keep pressing on this even though we get a lot of pushback and a lot of like, why can't we be like Apple or why can't we do this? But um, it's, um, it's interesting, but we keep pushing forward. And there's another example. And then the Fit and Style Lounge also became very important. This is the first earlier stages of it. Um, having like a, a graffiti artist do the upper part and then having, you know, where, you know, some sort of wallpaper. We didn't really know what we wanted to do at that time. Uh, having a, a seating area that definitely stuck. So the fit room, you know, becomes more open, really bright, a place to sit, a place to put your shoes, a place to put your bags. I mean, you're going, you're going to go in here and take your pants off. You're taking your clothes off. You want to be very comfortable in there. It's not a place to, to, to trifle. You really want to give everything you can to the consumer to feel comfortable because they will buy more. It's all a business proposition. <laughs> this is, we're listening to consumers because we want them to be happy in buying our products. So, and that's where it came out for uh, Stanford. So that's working with my decor guy who came up with the, with the wallpaper and the area rug and the seating. And so without him, it would have been probably more of a difficult path. And so he's been working on lots of things for the store in that regard. Shows up here. Okay, so. <laughs> This is a video that we did. This is called a sizzle reel in marketing. It's an interior video they like to create uh, for, um, it's more internal use, and it's to show how we're doing to the company. So there's normally music on here, but I'm not allowed to play it because we don't have the rights. But, so it's a little more exciting with the music, but um, I'm not going to sing. So, but anyway, this is a, what we're sending out to our, our company. Again, a lot of people I realize being in global 
they don't see everything. They only see what they see in their own country or their markets. So it's really important for us to connect everybody to what's going on out there. That's really a part of our global role is to show the best practices and bring them to the other clusters. So that's our responsibility, to really feed them as much of great work as possible so they can actually grow in their markets and learn from them as well. And we connect everybody too. I mean, they can all talk to each other, but. So we did about 621 when this came out about f four months ago. So that's a lot of work, <laughs> but um, it's pretty amazing. We do department stores. Uh, this is in Mexico, really went off really well. And so we translated from department stores to factory outlet stores to own and operated boutiques. Uh, we're in Poland and we're in Israel and we're in, this is uh, California, um, Stanford. So just kind of give you a selection of where we are, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Indonesia, Israel. And it's starting to really build this like brand identity that we didn't have before because it was very generic and focusing on the, f on the, five, on the, uh, on the house mark. So I think it's pretty amazing. We're transforming, I think, people's perceptions of the brand about it growing to something else, which has been pretty good. It's through the architecture. We did it, you know. So <laughs> I have to say that's been one of my proudest moments for working at Levi's is just getting to that one place. So it's all worth it. Okay. I wish I invented the blue jeans. They have expression, modesty, sex appeal, simplicity, all I hope for, for, for in my clothes, said by Yves Saint Laurent. So I put that up there because uh, there is a iconic view of luxury from a lot of different people. Luxury as well. I mean, I have a friend who works at Chanel and they wear, they wear Levi's. Ralph Lauren wears Levi's. You could wear Levi's in Ralph Lauren's offices. He allows that. It's not that he doesn't allow it. He's just going to ask you questions like, why are you wearing this Abercrombie thing when you have mine? But in this case, Levi's is totally cool for him. So I just wanted to show you the parts of the 501. This is form following function. The rivets were, the invention of this was 150 years ago. And the rivets were, uh, Jacob Davis was uh, the person who came up with this idea with his wife. Actually, I think she came up with it because she was tired of the, the pockets ripping the tools. So she started repairing those every night. So they went to rivets. And then it's also about how, you know, the stitching and the seams and how they actually reinforce a lot of the, the pockets. This is for the workwear, for the worker, the cowboy. And it got adopted by, you know, the rebel and the biker and, uh, and fashion. So um, one of the things that came up when I was putting this together was I thought, well, the arcuate, which is a symbol that's trademarked and that's very important to Levi's, it does a little scoop. I said, well, that's just, de that's just decorative, and it's not. I put my hand in my pocket, and the nubbiness of the stitching is to hold in a handkerchief, and it does work. That's why it's at the angle. So anyway, I discovered stuff, too. I, you know, every day there's something new. Thank you for making me do this, because I, I now know more. <laughs> so um, collaborations, this is considered natural because Coca-Cola, Levi's, America, this was 1978 collaboration. And then there's this Universal Studios Monsters, 100th anniversary of the Monsters of Universal Studios. This is like a, where Levi's is the host and the media is applying their graphics to this. And then you have the Levi's collaboration with Nike Air. Very, very strong collaboration. And then Comme de Gasson, Yuna Watanabe, using Levi's in a deconstructed way. Uh, on his clothes. He uses Levi's all the time. All right, so about collaboration. This is about the workshop. <laughs> um, I, I had to talk to the guy who does collaborations. I don't do collaborations, um, but I did talk to the marketing person, Mark Foxton, and he gave us some points on this. So this is what I learned from him. Um, it's a marketing goal. It's to trying to gain earned media. This is an important thing for the marketing team when it, to even do a pop-up or collaboration is because media costs so much money from commercials and, and Facebook and all that, paying for all that kind of media is very expensive. And if you get to zero dollars for something to, to promote a product or an idea or get that, they call them impressions, they have value for impressions, that's what they're going for. So both parties in collaboration must sign an NDA. An NDA is, an, is a uh, non-disclosure agreement 
like when I have to do anything or talk to any company, I have to have them sign this. This is like, because we're talking about stuff freely. So you gotta be really careful. I'm just giving that warning. In business, NDAs are very important. Um, you both have to see value and you, you have to kind of like, do I imagine this brand being the same sentence with me? Does it make sense? The reason to collaborate is storytelling. Find the right story to connect. Natural collaboration, I talked about. Best collaborations in a busy collaboration world, which we are in, get attention by presenting the unexpected. I think we did one with Sharpie, the Sharpie pen. I mean, that's unexpected. Identify the points of difference and be distracting and disruptive. This is not a volume filler, but could be a pre-tease of a launch of an upcoming general release product reinvigoration. I think this was uh, New Balance. They had a new shape. It goes down the runway. It's teased. People go, what's that? And then it comes out like within a month with a new product with all the different colors or whatever types you can do. Um, some collaborations are licensed deals and often in our connection to an anniversary, which you saw. And um, identify the launch. Um, you have to both agree how are we launching this? When are we launching this? Are we teasing this? Or are we going to do an embargo, which is this is the day we do it, which means you cannot send anything out before that date that you agreed. It's very critical because this is about a moment. You're trying to create a buzz, a, like, a big, big moment that's Instagram and around the world and newsworthy. This is a pop-up Levi's did in uh, 2019. This was for the Art Basel opening and it extended into the uh, Super Bowl, and they extended even further. It was basically an a empty lot in Fremont District. That's where all the, the graffiti, the, sorry, the graffiti, the uh, mural artists work. And um, it, they built this, and it's a, it's a complex showing, like there's a stage, and there's a place where they count down like when the next drop is gonna come, and there's a tailor shop, and you can, you can personalize your clothes, and it became a very, very destination. It can be a big destination for people, and so families were coming. We saw a lot of children, which was great, um, and so we kept it open. I think another month because it was so successful. So pop-up shops. Um, another thing I haven't done. I'm actually working on one now for Levi's 150th anniversary, which has been great. Um, working with the marketing team and learning from them. They're learning from me about programming and consumer flow and journey and how do, you, how do you do that. So we both have our own disciplines mixing together, which is great. Um, it's an event with a limited time, great opportunity to test the public's response to a product and presenting, presentation creative, you're creative. Uh, identify the points of difference to be distracting and disruptive. The location and site couldn't be the unexpected driver. Uh, this is not a, again, a volume filler. There's, it's not supposed to make money, but it can make money. What they find is if you have a ticket or you have a moment that the, the influencer or KOLs, as they call them, if they come to that and they are in the room, they feel it's an exclusive invitation and they will purchase. Usually you expect you just give it away, but actually they will buy the special items. Um, operations of the space must be planned and supported. Yeah, okay, so that's a big thing. It's, it's got to function. You got to make sure consumers aren't upset. They can't cash out or do any of that stuff. I mean, that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of the project that you have to really work through. Um, security detail has to be thought through. We had a store in Soho. We launched the uh, air joiners, and they shut down the store because the police were like, the, the crowds in front of it are interrupting the street. So we, had, we should have done better on that, but we learned. Um, Maintain brand principles, our principles. One of them is sustainability. You just have to make sure you're, you're doing that. And uh, most, most, mostly, should be fun and entertaining. Should be great. Should be like a fun thing to do. All right, so that is my run through for you. <laughs> so um, are there any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think as I hinted at it in the beginning, I think it's really wonderful to see the dialogue between brands and architecture and the way in which they benefit from engagement with one another. So the architecture in the case of these two companies is obviously really guided by the pre-existing ethos, vision, values of a brand. But 
the brands need the architecture to also visualize and spatialize that. And I think it's really interesting to me how those two companies deal differently with that. Like, they, like you said, they couldn't be further apart in terms of this immersion into a dreamlike world versus focusing on the object. It's totally different. Um, I have a question, but I think I'd love to hear questions from all of you first. Would anyone like to ask a question? So just looking at the example of the pop-up shop, would you say that pop-up shops are like maybe a main way that design can actually really show through? Because I've seen other examples and they can be like really interesting architecturally. So would you say that's a good way that architects can really express themselves while also expressing the brand? Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. I think it's a great exploration, like a laboratory, almost like Ralph does with, a, with the uh, home collection. It's a, it's a way to try things out. You know, we go after VR or other technologies that are current, and you kind of want to, like, how do you get people talking and buzz about it? It could be the buzz is the VR or something that augmented reality or something. It doesn't have to be just the, 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 the structure. But, yeah, I mean, that's what I think is exciting about pop-ups, that we can try things. That's like this pop-up I'm working on with the marketing team for San Francisco, it's in May, it's only for a week, but it, we took the Indigo concept and we said, what can we amplify and try something else? So we looked at the Fit and Style Lounge, we made it, we just blew it up, made it huge. Uh, we also made the, the shopping area about the 501, and so that was pretty cool to like try to, it was really product-led too. You know, I would say, for some reason, the architect team, our, my team, we get the Fit and Style Lounge. Like, that's our, that's our baby. The facade's our baby. The space planning is our baby. Like, the space, the circulation, all that. But we also partner with our VM teams, and they're the ones who are like, that, their baby's the product, how it's displayed. So basically, we're just like, what do you want to do? Oh, we want hang bars. We want it to be like this. And we're, we just sketch, and we work together. But we, we trade off, like, our, our responsibility. But it all goes to the consumer. All the same focus on the consumer. But absolutely. It's a place to try sculpturally. I think it's really the, the proving ground. And it's got to be something temporary you can take down, move away, or, or hopefully recycle. Um, you know, that kind of thing. That, that, that's what's so cool about pop-ups. So. Other questions? So Levi's has a really rich history, which can give you a lot of opportunity to lead or to lean into for design inspiration, but with such a uh, established identity, can that ever be restricting from a design standpoint in that it restricts where you can evolve the, the store designs? I used to think so. I mean, it's interesting because like Ralph Lauren, he still is influencing the design of the stores. He is still saying this is what works, what doesn't. We don't have that kind of force. We have our own forces of, of creative people who are, who are making sure that we are keeping up with the codes, the brand guidelines, the whole idea of the hand of the, of the product, the idea, like, there was a discussion about, like, taking the wood out of the stores because it's too much wood. And I showed some renderings, and I was like, if you take the wood out, it's going to look a lot colder and not our, not our brand. It's got to feel warm. And that warmth of that glow of that kind of gold really plays a good contrast on the color wheel with the indigo. So that, ver that reverberation is something that we just lean really hard into and keep playing with and testing. So in a way, the, the constraints actually create creativity in a way. It, it, it's, it's actually, I, I enjoy that part. Um, we, I came into this where the entire world was just doing whatever they wanted to. <laughs> I mean, it was like just lots of different interpretations of Levi's by a marketing person or an agency. Um, and when the CEO came in, it's like, we need consistency. Like Nike has a consistency of a swoosh. We need that logo to be consistent. And consistency also gives you standards. Standards gives you data. Standards also gives you scale. So you can actually you know, exercise the breadth of our footprint for, for um, purchasing fixtures and making deals on that, like procurement. So there's so much that kind of builds in, and that standards is something that was really hard for people. They thought it was a bad word, but we're like, no, this is our way of like a foundation. So we can be creative with pop-ups. 
we can be creative and do some installations of like really cool things like for a moment, I think that it becomes more like a foundation. But the brand ideals and stuff, they're new right now. I mean, we, we Levi's was much more of a, a manufacturer and then a distributor and still is. And um, huge wholesale business. We have 70% of our business with franchisees. So our stores, our, our identity as a store design was, wasn't much. There was not much there. And uh, so in a way that was like kind of daunting because you didn't know what to connect to, you know, and the opinions were, were, were it was difficult. I mean, you saw that general judge approach, which I thought was so creative and cool, but then when you talk to people, especially women, it just felt so dark and really like not, not, not a safe place to, to shop. So that's when it starts to becoming about consumers and their data and what they want. You know, if they say it's a sea of denim and I'm bored and I don't know how to do this or I can't find what I want, we gotta listen. And that's when we, we start doing that. So it's functional, I think. The functional part is what we're focused on the most, how to make it, what's the next generation? What's the next thing that we have to listen to the consumer about? What do they want? You know, so we're definitely focused on the young consumer and how they would like to shop. So I'm hoping I hear from you guys this <laughs> weekend on how you like to shop because I can bring it back and we can design for you, so. Any other questions? Uh, hi. So when a brand has like set designers or interior designers, I guess, then how much of that design process for the store is the architectural team actually like involved in? Great question. So when you do those big stores, those luxury stores, they're all working together. But the decor team seems, the decorative team, seem to have a lot of power. And so they can make changes to just about anything. But the architect team was very strong in detailing, millwork, um, the architecture of the building, the facades, like how the spaces work. That they would design this beautiful staircase with an elevator in the middle that wasn't there before, that looked like it was there all the time. You know, So there was a lot of attention that they could go to detailing and looking at books and looking at how that fits into that building. So there is a strong architectural element to it, but the leader of that, which you don't see in like an architecture firm, so maybe I'm wrong because I haven't worked in one to know this, but usually the architects do the building and then the decorator does the decorative after. This is like the decorative team is way more powerful than the architects. And I can tell you in the meetings, if they wanted something and they weren't getting, you're like, okay, I'll do it. I mean, they had a lot of power. And they should. They're very talented people. So it was a very different way of working. With department stores, when I was doing, it had less decorative, but I had a really strong decorative partner. And he was able to do it in a, in a good budget and quickly with me. And so we got the same feeling, but um, not, um, not the same budgets. I mean, everything you see in a Ralph Lauren store is real, authentic, bought in a, in a flea market in Paris or someplace. I mean, it is real, real stuff that they spend money on. You know. They buy, they buy artwork. They have an artwork person who just does art, you know, curates the art for them. There's warehouses of this stuff. It's pretty amazing what they have. So, but yeah, it, as architects, they were, we were sort of kind of supporting their vision, you know, so. Any others? Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, my question is based on like, um, how heavily does like gender play within the design? Being that like, I would assume that Levi's is like um, a unisex type of um, fashion industry. So like, how do you like connect that to the architectural aspect? so that you can gain more like customers and appeal to like a wider audience as well? That's a good question. Um, and, like I kind of lived it because like that concept was so, like we, we brought in these really strong leaders that were women and they had ver their own opinions about how they shopped in our stores. They went there and it's like, I don't want to buy anything in your fitting rooms, they're horrible. It, look, it looks like you stopped spending money 
like you gave up in the fitting rooms. And like that's where I, she goes, I can't think of a worse thing to do is to take my clothes off in a store and try something on, like bathing suit or jeans. And she was an influential person in that. And it, so we were focusing on her, as we say, focusing on her and what she would need, uh, because that's a huge bit part of our business that we went after and keep going after. So um, we do try to gear like bright, lighter, brighter, soothing spaces, I would say, um, not jarring. Um, but that's for everyone too. And I would say, you know, we are also thinking about uh, non-gender things as well, mannequins and so forth. So how do we, you know, appeal or have a diversity of mannequins. We have a very strong diversity of mannequin body types. So um, we are looking at that more and more. In fact, I just got an email yesterday from my boss. We have an ERG at Levi's called, it's Employee Resource Group. And it's called uh, ABLE. And it's about um, people who, it, it, there's, how do we design, the question was, how do we design our stores, brand experience, or consider um, how a person who has autism can relate into our store, or how do they, how would they feel in our store? And I don't have any background in that, and I'm excited to find out what we could do for that consumer, because it's another dimension that could actually help others, not just who have autism, but who are maybe it is very, you know, erratic the way we're we're doing things. We're not really considering everything, so. I don't know, that's what's exciting to me. It's all about iteration with retail design. You're constantly evolving and changing. It never stops. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's almost like the same thing, but you're, you're tuning it and fine tuning it constantly with questions like yours. <laughs> We're constantly asked that, and they're hard questions, and that's what helps frame up like, the situation, like, what are you gonna do about this? What are you gonna do about that? I mean, there's this thing called chips and beer where our CEO sits in the front of the room and answers any question. You can't even believe some of the questions. They're so hard, but he takes them, and it's pretty amazing. So um, we're constantly being open to that. And we're also very open about our my presentation. Um, there's a lot of companies that are not going to allow someone like me to do this. You know, we're very open sourced. Um, we have new technologies all the time that'll help sustainability, we're going to share it with everyone, where some companies might hold that as their intellectual property. So we do feel like we have a responsibility in the world, which I, that's another part I love about Levi's, is our, our place in the world and community. So it all works. It's just sometimes it takes a little time, but, you know, we get there. That's a good question. Thank you. Maybe one more? Hello. Again. So you mentioned that uh, the brand and the pillars for Levi are relatively new, and so you've been revamping stores all around the world. So then I wonder what an architect's role might look like in a retail uh, apparel business when you're not doing a rebrand. Are you maintaining the stores or constantly evaluating them? Okay. What are you doing? What am I doing? Okay, so you're I right. Mean, what keeps you busy? No, no, I, it's, a, it's awesome question. It's so true. Like Jesse was on my team. Like we're, when this all happened, it was exciting. You know, we, we were sketching, we we're doing stuff, we we're like getting into it. We felt like there was this path and we we're going to finally move forward to the next thing. It's a big push. And now all of a sudden it's like, it's just rolling out and it just keeps rolling out and iterating. And we, we still looking for other ways to make it better. But I started getting into like our process as a company. Um, data and how we build our Revit models and how they become virtual models and how that data can house in there and how we can connect to merchandising. So there's so much like digital twin that we're investigating. So I'm taking like my architecture in mind and I'm putting it towards helping the company in processes and procedures. Because uh, right now, because it's so, it's seven clusters, lots of different markets, and we're trying to like get to some consistency so we can have data, so we can analyze it to some solutions. And right now, I can tell you, everything is not where it needs to be. It should, we're working on that very hard. And so I'm gaining traction, and um, that's how I'm working on that now, but we're still talking about the next concept coming, so this work will happen again probably in a couple of years, uh, or, or for something that kind of jolts us into like, we have a new consumer, we can get them with this time, so let's do it. 
let's do something different, which I'm excited to see what that is. I can't even imagine what it is because I've been so deeply into this to not understand what it could be, but I'm excited for that. Again, the iteration is is fun, but it, the, yeah, that big moment is is great. So, so thanks for asking that question. It's a good one. Um, I'll end with a question. Um, the relative to consistency and finding this identity and rolling it out, I imagine there's still some malleability and flexibility relative to where that store is located. And I wonder, like, what, what are those variables that might cater to really making that store be of its place? Because there are certain things that are fixed. Yes. And there are certain things that are not, I guess. Yeah. Um, we have, we call them tiers, but now we've figured out recently that people don't understand what tiers mean. We, we called them... Uh, Indigo Platinum, Indigo Gold, Indigo Silver, Indigo Bronze. And we identified all the parts and pieces and the experience that you give up as you get to bronze. And we're not judging. We want, you, if it works for your consumer, pick bronze. If you want this, pick silver. Um, the difference in gold was it was like a lot of digital in the store, and it costs money. And it costs money to maintain. So it does come down to cost and, the, and what the consumer actually is going to re react to. I think that um, some consumers are going to sh into the store and they just want to buy something and, and leave or get a good deal or have a have that kind of like value experience, which is great, which is our consumer as well. Our consumer is broad. We're so democratic. Like it's, it's like, yes, I mean, we have stores in like small villages in the Philippines or, or a small village in, in Mexico and they're very, it's the same product. We still control this. And yet we have these other like beautiful buildings and beautiful malls and, and, and streets. So we appeal to so many different people, very diverse. And so that's exciting, but it's also it's hard to systemize. And so we try to systemize. That's our architecture background actually coming with these tiers because we're like, are you sure you want this? Do you want that? Um, there are kit of parts, but we don't want it to be a menu <laughs> where you pick and choose, which did happen. People are like, I'll take the storefront, but I'll do the bronze. And you're just like, oh, okay. But, you know, we kind of went with it because you sometimes just have to do stuff to see what happens and then control it again. So it's just like openness and then contraction. And so we're kind of the contraction part right now to, to really define who we are. We're trying to get to three packages, you know, so it's a little bit more stronger, a strength to each of those packages, making sense. So, yeah, it connects to the business connects to the consumer, that is the most important part. And we're trying to like challenge ourselves to think about when we plan our year and our budgets, who is our consumer per project? Who are they? Which concept do they get? So we can plan way in advance. Planning is the key. And then we can drive that stuff forward. So anyway, these systems have helped. And um, so anyway. Great. Um, thank you for sharing your work with us, Jeff. Thank you.